Good morning, church. My name is Grant Glover, and if we haven't gotten the chance to meet yet, I am the college pastor here at PCBC. And like Brandon said, this morning we are continuing on in our sermon series through Hebrews, and today we're talking about the better promise. And to kick us off, I wanted to kind of set up what we're going to talk about this morning. And the way I want to start is by saying, you know, if you couldn't tell by taking just like one glance up and down at me, I am a golfer. <laughs> it's a part of my brand. It follows me wherever I go. Oftentimes here at PCBC, I show up to church events dressed in golf attire, which causes all of my coworkers to lovingly give me the nickname of Tea Time, as if I've always got somewhere to be and <laughs> some golf round to massively mess up. So, Staying on brand with that, I'm going to start off talking about golf this morning and go on a little bit of a rant because I've got something to get off my chest. I've got to do it. And for the, not, for the 5% of you who care, this will be great. For the rest of the 95%, I apologize. Now, most of you have no idea about this, but to the, those who do, a, like a couple months ago, there's been this whole controversy about the PGA Tour and the Live Tour merger. You may have heard about it. It's kind of been on the news, but again, most of you don't care, but I'm talking about it anyway. Now, let me give you the Spark Notes overview for things you don't care about, much like the books you read in high school. Now, the PGA Tour is the tour that hosts most of the golf tournaments you watch on TV. Been around forever. Two months ago, this new rival, or I'm sorry, two years ago, this new rival tour comes about called the Live Tour, L-I-V. And what they wanted to do was pose themselves as a true competitor to the tour. And what they did is that they were backed by the Saudi Arabians, pretty much the Saudi Arabian government. And they were basically luring PGA Tour players away with guaranteed contracts of hundreds of millions of dollars, which does not exist in golf. It doesn't. You have to win to like make money. But they were saying, nope, we'll pay you $300 million, just come join us. They're just throwing cash everywhere. And as you can imagine, many famous players left the tour because they're like, I want to make more money. And a lot of the older guys did this as well because they're not playing as well anymore. And so what did the PGA Tour do in response? Well, the main, story, main character of this story, the commissioner, otherwise known as the snake, Jay Moynihan, has a PR crisis on his hands. No one likes the commissioner of any sport. Jay Moynihan, though, has put himself in a new category. So what did Jay Moynihan do? Well, he comes along and tells all the PGA Tour players, hey, don't take the money offered to you by Liv. The Saudi Arabians have been linked to journalists who have passed away. There are some links to 9-11. It would be wrong for you to take the money, so turn down life-changing generational wealth and stand with the tour and do what's right. That was his PR statement, and he said it again and again. And many players did. Many players followed suit. And Jay made all, this prom all these promises that the tour was going to beat out live that they were going to give out more money to players and that the players were going to be seen on the right side of history and that the Live Tour would collapse and everybody else would look dumb except the PGA Tour. But then, in an absurd turn of events two months ago, some news story came out of nowhere saying the PGA Tour and the Live Tour had announced a merger. Jay had worked behind the scenes with the Saudis, not consulting any players or his lawyers, and now he got bought out by the Saudi Arabian government, who has now pumped money into golf and took the money he told all of his players not to take to be moral people. Like I said, the snake. So, and look, many people, golf traditionalists like myself, are not happy about this. But the thing that makes everybody the most mad and the most ticked is not the merger. No, it was how Jay literally told all of his players, many of whom had injuries this past year and could have made a lot more money, to turn down a lot of money for moral reasons, only to then accept that same money he told them not to take and was bought out. Unbelievable rant over. <laughs> now, 
This doesn't just happen to ultra wealthy professional golfers. This is an absurd example, but this kind of thing does happen to all of us. Some of you have dealt with people in positions of power saying one thing to you, promising to do one thing, and then later turning their back and acting in their own self-interest. That's happened to some in the room. Or maybe it wasn't somebody in power, but somebody in your life has gone back on what they said to you and decided to do something different. In the past of every person in this room lies some kind of broken promise. You thought your parents would always be on your side, and then they weren't. You thought your spouse would always be trustworthy, and then they weren't. You thought your boss had your back and that they were looking out for your self-interest and noticed all the hard work that you were putting in, and then they didn't. Or maybe it's something more abstract. Maybe it wasn't a person, but maybe it was, it's culture that's promised you things. Maybe you thought the American dream was real, and by now you'd be in a much better spot than you currently are. Or maybe you thought because Christian culture promises all sorts of things about marriage that you'd be dating somebody by now. Or maybe you thought that because you have been coming to church or being a Christian, walking in the Christian life, that God would make sure that certain things will happen in your life and they have not happened and you're confused. Broken promises are painful because people say one thing and then do another or we perceive one thing's going to happen and another happens and it causes us not to trust people. It causes hurt. It causes pain. It leaves us confused, not knowing how to move forward and navigate all of this. And so the question is, what can we actually trust in? How can we find something that won't fail us? How can we find healing for dealing with all of the broken promises and learn to move forward in life being able to trust again? And we're going to find that answer in Hebrews 8, 1 through 13. And in this passage, we're going to see three things, our classic three points for the morning. The end of religion, the continued ministry, and the better promise, the title for this sermon. So let's jump into it. Let's first talk about the end of religion. Now, this title is intentionally provocative. Uh, it's meant to kind of raise a flag of like, what's he talking about? But if you're going to find something that won't fail you, you're going to need religion to end in your life. And that sounds odd, but let me explain. Many feel like this is how things work. I go to church. I'm a good person, at least better than the guy next to me. I work hard for my family. I try to raise my kids right. But then life circumstances may head south, and you turn around and look around and think, I'm not terribly happy with my life right now, and my faith does not seem to be contributing anything positive to it. My neighbor, who doesn't try at all, seems to be a lot happier than me, and so maybe God is not actually being faithful to me. Maybe there's something wrong here. And if you feel that way, if you feel that God has broken some kind of promises or that life has broken promises... The author of Hebrews comes in to speak and warns against this and calls that kind of thinking religion. Let me show you. Look at Hebrews 8.1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Now the high priest mentioned here is Jesus. And this passage, this verse obviously seems kind of cryptic. It's got some confusing language in it, but this is a, would have been a huge deal to the original hearers of Hebrews, and to understand why, you have to know what Judaism was like and what Roman religion was like at the time. At the time in Judaism, there was a high priest. He had to wear certain things, do certain practices. He was always making sacrifices on behalf of the people so that they would know their sins are forgiven. And he stood as the mediator between God and man at the temple. And he was the person that people went to. And Roman priests wouldn't have been much different. They instead were at the temple of the pagan gods like Zeus or Apollos or whoever. And they would also had all these rituals. They also had all these 
things that they would wear, and they would offer sacrifices to the pagan gods to make sure that they weren't angry and they wouldn't bring chaos and famine and war into their communities. But then Christianity comes along and says something different. Christianity comes along and the author of Hebrews comes along and says that Jesus is our high priest, but he is not here on earth in temples. He is in heaven. And if you look at Hebrews 8.1, what is he doing there? What's he doing in heaven? He's seated at the right hand of God. He's sitting. Who sits? What kind of priest who's supposed to be doing all this work, all the sacrifices, sits down? Well, it would be one whose work is accomplished. One who no longer needs to offer sacrifices. One who no longer needs to be at the temple to do, carry out all these rituals. And you see, this is radical. This idea of Jesus being a high priest in heaven and not in a temple would, be, would have been revolutionary for the time. And to understand it, there was a great British preacher by the name of Dick Lucas. And in his sermon on this passage, he imagines a conversation between a Roman or Jew with a Christian at that time to understand what the differences would have been like, and it went like this. The Roman would say, oh, he meets a Christian, I see you have a new religion. Very interesting. Where's your temple? And the Christians would say, we don't have a temple. Jesus is our temple. Well, where do your priests operate then? Like, where, like, you have to have priests, right? Where are they? And the Christian would say, we don't have priests. Jesus is our priests. No more priests for us. Well, that makes no sense. Well, wh how, where do you offer sacrifices? Where do you do things to make sure that God will accept you? And they would answer, Jesus is our sacrifice. We're already accepted. No more need for sacrifices. And the Roman would be stumped. What kind of religion is this? And the Christian would answer, it's not a religion. It's not one. You see, the gospel comes along, and in opposition to religion, which says, I do this, therefore I get this, which you can see how this fits into the idea of broken promises, the gospel comes in and says, Jesus comes down as God in the form of man, and he dies on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice so that no more have to be made. Jesus Christ ultimately comes and says, I conclude the work of religion. It's over. Being close to God has been accomplished, not by what the priests have done, not by what you are doing, but, but by what I have done. I have finished it. There is no more need for religion. What he's saying is that those who believe in Christ as the high priest who has made the ultimate sacrifice, that his work is enough, they are forgiven. There is no more having to work to please God or get close to him, and no religious figure has to keep on making sacrifices and standing as the mediator between people and God because God himself is our mediator. This is the end of religion. Jesus has completed all the work that is necessary. Christianity is not a new religion. It is the end of it. It's the conclusion of it. While religion says, I obey, therefore I'm accepted, the gospel says, I am accepted, therefore I obey. It flips all of the world's conventional standards of transactions on its head. And if that's true, then that means you don't have to fear broken promises because God will not turn his back on you because the work is accomplished. And this is hard to fully live our lives by because our heart's default mode when we are on autopilot is religion. I do this, therefore I get this. It works in our business relationships, our friendships, and oftentimes in our relationship with the Lord. And that's, you know, we live in a world where we do good things, expecting good things in return. That's just the way everything works, but that at its core is religion. And that's why you feel like you've experienced broken promises and that you're unable to trust anybody anymore and maybe have some doubts about trusting God. 
But to the degree that you know that religion is ended and you no longer have to work for God's approval, when you understand how Jesus ended all of that, it's the, also the end of your disappointment over broken promises. Because let's be honest, broken promises hurt. And all these things I'm saying don't take away the pain of any of it. They hurt because you feel cheated, lied to, and you feel invalidated as if you're not important enough for a promise to be kept to you. And that stings. But if the creator of the universe dies for you and says, I will love you no matter what you do, my promise to you will not be turned back against you, then all, it doesn't remove the pain or the hurt or the confusion of broken promises, but you have something to survive broken promises between people. An anchor to help you survive because you now have perfect validation from God. You have been fully accepted. That cannot be taken away and the transactions are done and over with. The end of religion is also the end of disappointment. Now, when I say that, you might think, all right, Grant, I've heard the whole spiel on Jesus dying on the cross, and I understand that, but that happened in the past. That's, that's something that happened a long time ago. What is happening in the present? What is God doing now, and how do I know he's not distant from me because I sure as heck feel very distant from him right now? And if you feel that way, we're going to talk about that in our second point, and that is the continued ministry. That's a good question, and we're going to unpack it. We're going to talk about the continued ministry of what Jesus is doing. And to do so, we're going to look back at the passage and see the other implications of what Jesus being a high priest entails. Because if you look at verse 1, it says that it talks about where Jesus is now, and it's at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Jesus is in heaven at the moment after the resurrection. And the fact that he's seated doesn't mean he's not doing anything currently. It just means his main work is complete. And being seated on a throne is an indication and a metaphor of him holding a position. Much like being seated on the bench, like a justice. He's holding a position. But what is he doing? What is this position? Verse 2. He is a minister in the holy places. Jesus is a minister. Christ has a ministry right now in the presence of God. Now that may sound like it contradicts my first point where Jesus has ended religion. It's supposed to be over, but now I'm saying that Jesus has a current ministry. Are you saying the work is not done and no, it's not true? That's not what I'm saying. What you have to understand is it something that we miss a lot, and it's Christ's intercession on behalf of believers. Now, that's a big word, intercession, and it's the primary ministry of Jesus right now. And Dane Ortland, a Presbyterian preacher, says that one of the more neglected doctrines in the church today is the heavenly intercession of Christ. For many of us, our functional Jesus isn't really doing anything right now. But the Bible says he is. This is all throughout the book of Hebrews. You can find it in Romans 8, 34 and 1 John 2, 1, that Jesus is our intercessor. And when you hear that word, when you hear the word intercessor, you may have heard it said that it means to represent someone in a legal sense. Like Jesus is some defense attorney against God the Father being angry with us and wanting to judge us. And Jesus is defending us as some kind of defense attorney. But that's not quite right because the Greek word for intercessor is intunkano. And all that word means is to approach someone. It can mean to pray or it can mean to converse with someone. That's what Jesus does as the intercessor. Jesus being our minister, our intercessor in heaven, prays for us, converses with the Father on our behalf, and approaches him on our behalf and the question is why? Why does he have to do this? Another great British preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones, puts it this way. We must never think of it as if Jesus were there pleading for us before an unwilling God. 
But of this we can be quite certain, that as the Jesus looked after his followers on earth, as he looked after their interests and did certain things for them, so now he is representing his people in heaven, looking after us and our interests. So he's looking after our interests, representing us in heaven. How so? What many theologians talk about is that he, is, he represents us in heaven. He's our representative so that we know we have free access to the throne of God and to the grace of God. And what the heck does that even mean? To many of you that may sound like abstract theologian talk that has no real practical implications for our day-to-day lives, but it does, and I'll try to illustrate it. Because if you don't understand this doctrine, this idea that Jesus represents us in heaven and is our intercessor, you will live in fear of God breaking promises to you and not having somebody advocating on your behalf. So let me put it this way. Here in Dallas, let's be honest, we love clout. Now I hear a few chuckles, that's people who know what clout means. For my older friends in the room, clout is essentially being seen as cool having status, being popular. So clout is having this big network of influence, the people who like you. And then there's this other word, other phrase, clout chaser, which is, again, very descriptive of people in Dallas, where we chase after people who have clout and want to be in their circles. We want to be popular just like they are. We want to be around the right people. We love to know the right people, let's be honest. That's just like what we do, we're Dallasites. Like how often do you name drop the country club that you're a member at or like the lake house you have? Or that like that one time you met that C-list celebrity and talked to them for like two seconds and now all of a sudden you know them. Or for my younger friends in the room, how many of you have that one TikTok that got 50,000 views and all of a sudden you're popular? You're not. <laughs> but that's beside the point. Look, so we all, love, we all love being around the right kind of people. And I want you to imagine with me that the person you would most love to meet, the person you would most love to be in their circle and be around them, that that person comes to Dallas and is speaking somewhere, doing some event, whatever, fundraising dinner, you name it. And you come and line up by the red carpet or wherever the entrance is to meet where they're walking by, and there's paparazzi, and they've got their entourage with them, and everything's happening. And as they walk by, you have your resume, or maybe like your social media page, or if you're really out there, your Hinge profile, and you're trying to show people, look how cool I am. You're trying to show this VIP, look at what I've done. Look at the things I have. I'm cool. Do you want to have lunch with me? What's going to happen? Well, you might get backhanded by their security team, like Britney Spears did recently, by Victor Wimbanyana's security team. I hear like 20 chuckles. The rest of you need to Google that story because it's hilarious. It's on TMZ, great reporting, free Britney 2.0. But here's the, here's the point. Instead of being, what if, instead of being backhanded by a security team, what if one of your friends from college was in the entourage, was in the, in the know, in the group of people walking in, and they saw you and say, hey, I, I remember you from college. Good to see you. Would you like to come in with the VIP and have lunch with him or her? You'd be thrilled. All of a sudden, you'd be let in the room. You could come talk with them, ask them the questions you've always wanted, and try to get their number, but they'll probably give you a fake one, but that's okay. You at least got to talk to them. And that, in a bit of a stretch, is how Jesus is our intercessor. Because what it means is that we know that he is in the entourage. He is the one who represents us in heaven. We have access to God bold, with boldness and confidence because he's there. He's the one who died. He's the one who's looking after us. And we know we will not get turned away. And it's impossible to be far apart from God because Jesus Christ is representing us in heaven right beside him. 
That's why this is so important. This is the continued ministry of Jesus. The work of religion is accomplished, but he is not done advocating for his people. Jesus represents us in the present. And here's why this is so important. Don't miss this. Some of you live from time to time, maybe not always, but at least in periods, in immense self-condemnation. You are worried that God is angry, that your life won't turn out because you don't live right, because you've had people in your life go back on their word, and you don't think you can trust anyone anymore. And maybe that leads you to think that you can't trust God either. And even if many people have abandoned you, God is not like that. He's not like them. He's different. You can have confidence because you don't have a human high priest. You don't have a human intercessor. You don't have a human mediator. You have God himself who shed his blood for you as your mediator and as your intercessor. It is not your resume that gives you access to God. It is the resume of Jesus Christ, which is perfect. And he's there to represent you, even though you are flawed and you will make mistakes and there is grace upon grace for you. And let me tell you, friends, you need that because a lot of times, many of you live in shame because you blame yourself for the broken promises people have made against you in your life. You think, it's my fault. I'm the reason they left. I'm the reason I'm a failure. I'm the reason I've been abandoned. It's all about me. But in the midst of that self-condemnation, Jesus condemns you not. He is your intercessor. He is the one who gives you access to the king of heaven. He is the one who is advocating for you on your behalf. He is your intercessor representing you to the most important VIP there could possibly be. And he says, come, you have access now. I judge you not. Come have access to the king and know you are accepted because I'm there. He didn't just do things on earth like ending religion. He did do that. He is also continuing now, continuing on in his ministry so that you know that your condemnation against yourself is unjust because he is there and he condemns you not. Now, all that being said, that still leaves us with one question and it's this. There's this tension in the passage between an old promise and a new promise. And you may be thinking, if there's such thing as an old promise from God and a new promise, does that mean God can break his promises and abandon me and break his promises towards me? And that's a good question. And we'll end here with my third and final point, the better promise. And we have to talk about this because there's a lot of confusing language in the passage between the Old and New Covenant, and we'll take just a second to unpack that. And we'll do so by looking at verses 4 through 5 in Hebrews 8, which says, There are priests who offer gifts according to the law, and they serve as a copy and shadow of heavenly things. Here's what that means. In the Old Testament, where God makes a covenant, which is just a stronger word for promise with Israel, they have all of these laws they have to keep and sacrifices they have to make. And many people think that the Old Testament is about Israel being saved by the law and sacrifices, but that's a misconception and that's not true. If you've been keeping up with our dwell readings where we have these bookmarks where we're going together as a church through Exodus and Hebrews, you can pick them up outside. You may have noticed in Exodus that God rescues the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and then gives them the law. It's not the opposite. He rescues them and then gives them the law to keep. He doesn't say, be good little Israelites and I'll save you. No, he says, he saves them And then says, I have made a promise to you, a covenant to you. I've saved you. I want you to be mine. Now live in relationship with me. And he basically gives them two basic instructions. Have no other gods before me and don't make idols. And they constantly do that. All throughout their history, all throughout the Old Testament, all the boring chapters that it's hard to get through in your little Bible reading plan, 
over and over and over and over again. They go back and worship idols and worship other gods. And so God doesn't break his promise to them. Israel breaks their promise, which is why the author of Hebrews quotes Jeremiah 31, which is that little condensed section in Hebrews 8. And in verse 9 of Hebrews 8, which again is referring to Jeremiah 31, it says that God will make a covenant not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. God makes a promise. He saves them and says, do these things to be in relationship with me. And Israel says, no, thank you. Now, your question you may be thinking is, but wait a minute. I kind of have a tendency to disobey God from time to time. I have a tendency to disobey God. And in fact, we all do it on a daily basis. Can he ditch me in the new covenant? And the answer is no. God does not break his promises to the Israelites. In fact, he fulfills his promises to the Israelites by doing something they never saw coming. Look at verse 6 in Hebrews 8. Jesus Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better. What the author is saying here, the point he's making, is that God made promises in the Old Testament. And they were a shadow or a copy of things that would be fulfilled and are pointing to Christ. That Greek word for shadow or copy is like, was used to describe sketches made by kids of like real life things that their parents would try to teach them how to draw. And so it's like the difference between the old and the new covenant is the difference between like toys and the real thing. Like growing up, I had toys wherever I went. Up to a certain age, I got off of them. I got bullied enough in middle school. It's okay. We moved on to video games. But for a long time, I had toys. Action figures, sports figures, stuffed animals, you name it. And I would always carry them with me and play with them when I got bored. And it's great for kids to play with toys because they show you what the real thing is like. But it would be a mistake to mistake the majesty of a toy lion with that of the real thing. It represents the real thing, but it does not fully capture what the real thing is like. And so that is what is going on with this shadow copy of the old covenant and new covenant. God does not ditch Israel in the old covenant because he comes to offer them a new covenant. The things that they did in the old covenant were pointing to the day in which he would fulfill all the promises he makes to them. He does not break a single one. Something, he comes and brings the real thing, the Messiah, God incarnate, which is to which all the old stuff in the Old Testament pointed. And how are these things fulfilled? It's all throughout Hebrews 8, verse 1. Jesus made one sacrifice for all times so that there are no more frequent sacrifices. Verse 2, Jesus ministers in heaven and not a temple. He's a minister over all. Verse 10, rather than give it, Jesus giving us some kind of law to follow, it says from Jeremiah 31, God says, I will put the law in their minds and write the laws on their hearts. The old covenant was good. It was not bad. But the new covenant in Hebrews 8, 6 says, it's enacted on better promises. And that's the key to understanding the new covenant, the new promise. The strength of the promise that the new covenant makes can heal the hurt that you've experienced from all the broken promises you've dealt with in your life. And here's how. When many of you think or hear of the word covenant, you might think contract. But that's not quite right because a contract is basically saying one party does this, the other does this, we sign and we have a deal. If you break the contract, it's over, nullified, void. But covenant in the Bible is something much, much stronger. And it's like this. Imagine if you start off a marriage, this would be like a contract type situation where both people come to each other and say, I will treat you well to the degree that you treat me well. For example, I will buy you flowers to the degree that you let me play golf as much as I want. My fiance is here. I swear I will not do that. 
But look, what would that be? Why, why is that so bad? Why does that make people laugh? Because that relationship is going to go horribly if that is the conditions. If it's, I'll do this if you do this, then there, it will become cold, distant, resentful, resembling a business relationship. There will be no intimacy. It's a contract. There's no intimacy. There's no openness. There's no vul- vulnerability. And what's the better alternative? It would be, in the Christian understanding of marriage, if two people came together and said, I will be the best in this relationship, whether you are or not. Your needs will be bigger than mine. I'm binding myself to you and will care for you and be kind to you, whether I feel like it or not. That relationship will be intimate. It will be safe. It will allow for people to be vulnerable about their mistakes and their flaws, not performing anymore, not living in fear of messing up. And that is what makes the new covenant better, the new promise, the stronger promise that Jesus makes. In the old covenant, God bound himself to his people by coming to them and calling them his. In the new promise, the new covenant, Jesus dies for his people, gives the very drops of his blood for them, saying, I am going to love you whether or not you perfectly uphold the covenant to me. He's not going anywhere. He has bound his life up with ours and promises to forgive, heal, and take care of us. And that's how you can fully understand the first two points, this idea of religion ending and Jesus' continued ministry. And it can heal the hurt caused by all the broken promises in your life. Because here's the better promise. Jesus promises us the relationship we've always dreamed, where we are fully known and fully loved, and he says, I will love you no matter what. No matter what comes. Now, one thing about the new covenant that can sometimes make it difficult is that it's less tangible than the old. You see this in the passage. In the old covenant, you could see the priests you could go to. You could see the sacrifices. You could see the temple. But in the new covenant, we have Jesus as our priest. He was our sacrifice. He is our temple. So it's a lot of things unseen. But God has given us toy lions, so to speak, Things like the Lord's Supper, the physical presence of the people of God in church, and scripture to remind us the promises he's made. And the written words from God in the Bible are there to remind you he isn't going anywhere, that his promises will last forever, which is why we've been reading it together as a church. And it's at this point I'd like to invite Clint Williamson up to the stage He is a member here of PCBC who has been going through our dwell readings together with us. So everybody give give Clint a round of applause here as he comes up on stage. So Clint, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Grant. My name is Clint Williamson. Uh, My wife, Bethany, and I have been members since 2008 when we got married. And we have three children, Luke, Rhett, and Lila who are all running around here somewhere this morning. (laughs) Awesome. So, Clint, in your dwell readings, you've been reading through Scripture, what are some of the things that you have seen or done that have impacted you, and how have you seen God's promises throughout your readings? Yeah, so I guess I'll start answering that by saying, for a long time I knew I should be reading Scripture, um, and so I was, to, to sort of check the box. And I've always done a lot of praying to God, talking to God, um, but I never did a lot of listening, and I would get frustrated of why I didn't know what to do or didn't know what next step to take. And so um, that's something that this dwell uh, reading has helped me with. Uh, first of all, it helps knowing that everyone in the church is doing the same reading, so it makes me feel connected during the week. But um, just spending time to, to be quiet beforehand um, and then afterwards, after the readings, and really trying to see let the scripture read me instead of just reading the scripture. So what, what is God's character in this story? How can I see myself in it? Uh, and what have I learned? And so some of the things I've seen recently reading through Exodus and Hebrews, just that God loves us, that he wants to deliver us from slavery, um, that he uh, will protect us, that he will equip us to do what we're called to do. Uh, I've been going through a little bit of a career transition recently. So the natural reaction is to be anxious or scared and everybody comes up. It's like, Oh man, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, well, 
I'm not, because I feel excited and joyful. I, I know the Lord is working in my life. I don't know how, but I know where the end destination is, and having that promise through Jesus is uh, pretty special. That's awesome. Thank you, Clint. Can I pray for you real quick? Please. Yeah. Father, thank you for Clint and his testimony and what, he's, what you're doing in his life, and I pray that as he continues to read your word, that you would continue to remind him of your promises and the things you have promised him, and that you would continue to reveal to him your will, and that as he goes through career transition, that you would be with him, reminding him that you have not left him, you are his advocate, and that you are not going anywhere, that you be with him and his family, that they would grow and prosper, and they would continue to find more and more joy in you. In your name I pray, amen. Yep, thank you. Give it up for Clint, everybody. So as the band comes up, here's how I want to end. Um, talking about broken promises, the pain and the frustration and the apathy you feel over people not holding up their end of the deal is real. And that's something I can't take away, and I am sorry. All those, the emotions it brings up, the feelings, I can't take away. I wish I could. But all I can do is point you to a God who makes a better promise than any other human being could. Any other human you try to find that promise that you so desperately want for someone to finally not turn their back on you, you can find that only fully and perfectly in God because he dies for you before you did anything for him. and says, I'm not leaving. And some of you feel like you are at a place where it's hard for you to trust people. Your trust has been shaken. You have stopped sharing your struggles with other people for fear of judgment, for fear of people casting you out, for looking down on you. Or maybe you find yourself constantly checking the text on your spouse's phone because you're just worried, anxious that they are going to leave you like other people have. And I understand that. I get that. People have wronged you. But what I am saying is that instead of running to other sources to try to find somebody who will finally uphold their promise, right in front of you is a God who says, I will uphold my promise no matter what because I give you my very blood and I promise I'm not going anywhere. In Jesus, you find someone who died for you before you did any good thing for him and he says, you're mine. It's a promise you can trust. And it's only to the degree that you find comfort in the promise, uh, this promise, that you'll be able to be open to new relationships, that you're able to be vulnerable with people, not performative or transactional or living out religion anymore, but understanding that you've already been accepted and that you don't have to worry and be deathly afraid of people leaving you because God is with you. And you'll be able to take all broken promises in your life on the chin. Not removing the pain, not removing the agony of it, not removing the stress, not removing the anxiety, but having an anchor to get you through it all. And it's because religion has been ended. Jesus continues to minister now. And he comes to offer a better promise. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today and thank you for your word. I thank you for all of the promises that you have made to us, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. You have said that religion is over, there is no more working. You are our high priest, Lord Jesus, in heaven. And you represent us. And we know that no matter what we do, you have get, given us free access to God with boldness and with confidence. And I pray that we trust that. For my friends in the room who are hurting and who have the sting of broken promises in their life, that they would know that you are not like other people. You are God and perfect, and you gave your life so that we can live in comfort and the security that you will never leave us. And that is what our hearts fully and truly desire. That is all that we need. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.